church today. Um, we are uh, doing our Lord's Supper today. Uh, it is a week early. If you saw the announcement, we changed things kind of the last minute. Uh, but we'll also be doing a food pantry offering. And so I'd uh, like to ask if uh, we could have some ushers at the end of the service stand at the, the back so uh, folks can give to that food pantry offering uh, as they need to. Also, uh, Carlos offering, we'll be taking that up next week. Um, then um, we, uh, we have our choir music coming up next Sunday. 
Uh, so, so be aware of that. Deacons meeting tonight. Uh, WOM on the 14th. Uh, on the 19th, there'll be no Sunday night service. But on the 22nd, there'll be a candlelight service. And so, so be aware of that. All right. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And I, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the incredible blessing that you sent us 2,000 years ago when you sent your son to be born in a manger, uh, and uh, Lord, to, to change us, to save us from sin, to give us a hope and a future. Uh, Lord, how great you are, and how great your faithfulness is to us. Um, thank you for your ministry to us, and I pray, God, that today you would be ministering in the hearts of your people. Father, I pray that you'll minister uh, to each specific need today uh, as, we, as we worship, as, as the time of the message comes. Uh, Lord, we also pray for those who don't know you today, Father, and those in our prayer box for Operation Andrew Liss, uh, and those uh, here today who don't know Christ, or those who are watching online who don't know Christ. And Father, we pray for their salvation. Uh, Father, draw them with your spirit and convict and convince and help. Uh, and, uh, Father, we just pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified and honored in this place. Help us worship you as you desire, God, with a full heart and uh, with gratitude for all that you've done for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lots of people have, uh, have pointed out the significance of when the announcement was given of Christ's birth. Uh, it was in. It was not in the palace, but in the in the fields where the shepherds were. Only shepherds uh, with, with this lowly job, and, and uh, so uh, signifying that uh, that Christ is available to all, regardless of your position in life, and, and so forth. And and uh, so M one eighty eight is a, is a message reflects that when it says it came upon the midnight clear. Let's stand as we sing. Continue to sing. We praise you.
sitting this child, this son, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, born not in a palace, but in a lowly manger. Thank you that he's available to all, all who will call upon his name and be saved. Thank you that he, also that he grew to be a man, laid down his life willingly upon a cruel cross for us. Such love, God. We celebrate that this season. We thank you for your love and pray that all would come to know you and be free pardon of sin. We give you praise in Jesus' name. The choir has a song we'd like to share with you. And uh, I love this uh, because it, it, uh, it talks about not just the baby in the manger, but the reason that he came. Oh. 
right, uh, we're getting ready to do Lord's Supper, and uh, some of you have been with us when we've done it this new way, but just as a refresher, you, uh, you grab this, this top thin piece on the top and pull that back, this clear piece, kind of have to rub your finger on the edge of it, and that will get you your bread, okay? Then after that, you've got another one there that where you pull the hard tab up, and you pull that off, and that will get you your grape juice, okay? Um, so uh, we're going to uh, spend this time uh, just celebrating the greatness of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us. Because Jesus Christ didn't just come to be born in a manger. He came to die on the cross and to be raised again, to ascend and then to come back in mighty power to rule and reign, and he shall reign. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I'm going to uh, begin by reading a scripture. It says, In the day of unleavened bread came, on which he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make ready for us the Passover that we may eat. And they said to him, Where will thou that we make ready? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house whereunto he goeth. And you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished, and there make ready. And they went and found as he had said to them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the apostles with him. And he said to them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I shall not eat it until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he received a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I shall not drink from his fourth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the cup in like manner after the supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood, even that which is poured out for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man indeed goeth as it has been determined, but woe unto the man through whom he has betrayed. And so we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper to, to celebrate the broken body and shed blood. Jesus died for me and Jesus died for you. And uh, when Jesus took this bread, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the nails that you took in your hands and feet for us, for the crown of thorns upon your brow, for the lashes of a cat of nine tails whip upon your back. But even more, Lord, that you became sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. Thank you for your amazing sacrifice for us. Thank you for your amazing heart, God, that you love us that much that you'd give yourself for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John 6, 58 says, This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he that eateth this bread shall live forever. On that same night, our Lord took the cup, and having blessed it, gave to his disciples and said, This is my blood which was shed for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you shed at Calvary's cross. Thank you that your blood cleanses us of all sin as we put our trust in you. And thank you, Lord, that uh, our sin is buried in the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west because of what you have done. That we have been cleansed, as David prayed, purged with hyssop. Uh, so that we can be clean and washed so that we can be whiter than snow. We praise your great name for the great sacrifice that you made. And we pray it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Hebrews 9.22 says, And according to the law, I may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and apart from the shedding of blood there is no remission. 1 John 1.7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we look back to his sacrifice, but we look forward to his coming. Jesus is coming to set this world right. Amen. Hallelujah and praise his name. All right. Um, look with me, if you will, in the book of Luke, chapter 1, and verse 26. Luke, chapter 1, and verse 26. And let's everybody stand. I'll just get the blood flowing a little bit. Get the, we're gonna we'll read this scripture together, and then uh, then uh, I will I'll let you be seated. Uh, Luke one verse twenty six. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by that statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. You can be seated. Years before this episode in Mary's life, three Jewish young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stood before a, a pagan tyrant king named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had found out that they had not bowed to his statue. He had made a statue to himself, and he commanded all the peoples to bow to the statue. They had refused to bow, and somebody told on them. And so they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, Okay, if you will bow, I'm going to have the music play one more time. If you will bow, we're good. You, you bow, you worship, you're fine. But if you will not bow, you're going to be thrown into this fiery furnace. And they responded, King, our God is able to save us from the furnace. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. Because we're servants of the Most High God. Well, of course, this didn't go over too well with Nebuchadnezzar. He got very angry. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter. It was so hot that when the guards who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed to go to the fiery furnace, when they took them there to throw them in, they died from the flames. But Nebuchadnezzar's watching this scene, and he says, I see three men walking around in the fire, and a fourth, like unto a son of the gods, which we know is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Amen. He was right there with them in the middle of the flame. And the Bible says that not only did they not die from the flame, but the only thing that was burned up were the bonds that were on their hands as they were thrown into the fire. And they didn't even smell like smoke. Now this is the power of our God. Uh, you know, many times in life we 
struggle with fear, right? Sometimes we're afraid of the future. We don't know what's going to happen in my future, uh, how are things going to go in our country, or whatever the case may be. Uh, sometimes we struggle with fear about our finances or about work or about family. And uh, sometimes we are afraid because we see things happening in our culture that we have no control over. And we think, what is going to happen? And, and we feel out of control and we feel afraid. But one of the amazing things about this story that we're reading today is that in the midst of chaos... They had chaos in those days, too. They were under Roman rule. In the midst of all of this, God is in control. His plan is being carried out. He had promised a Messiah. He's sending a Messiah. His Messiah is going to fulfill the plan that he has for him. And so he sends his angel to speak to this young woman named Mary, probably a teenager. And he says to her, you found favor with God, and you're going to bear a son, and he will be the son of God. And her life was changed. And as the angel, whenever angels appear in glory in Scripture, people are afraid. And uh, he, he coaxes her, and he tries to calm her fears, but he also shares the good news of what God is doing. And, uh, and Mary says, let it be to me as you have said, and uh, you know, it's amazing to me that this young woman had the courage because all of this was going to, to bring about some things in her life that would be very uncomfortable for her. Uh, she was considered by many uh, to be uh, someone who'd been immoral, who had a child out of wedlock, which was not the case. Uh, she, she, was, uh, she was considered uh, by the rulers of Judea as a threat. And so they tried to hunt down the child to kill him. Uh, she had a lot of different... And then she got to see her own son die on the cross. I mean, how's that for trouble? But throughout, this, throughout it all, God had a plan for Mary. And he was working in her life, though she didn't understand all the ins and outs of it. And God was doing a great work. We, you know, when we're afraid, we need to follow the directions God has given us in dealing with fear. And there's several things he tells us in this passage of Scripture that will help us in dealing with the problem of fear. The title of my message is A Prescription for Fear. What does God uh, instruct us to do? Well, first of all, when we're afraid, we need to rejoice. Rejoice. Verse 28, an angel came to her and said, greetings, my translation says. Literally, the word means rejoice. Now, it was a, a common greeting in those days. But how fitting in the midst of this circumstance for Mary to be instructed to rejoice. Rejoice! God's at work. He's not finished yet. He's doing something in your life. He has a plan. Amen. And uh, she was to rejoice. She would get to bring up Jesus Christ in her household. Now, I, one of the things that's going to be really cool to me when we get to heaven, we get to see what happened in Jesus' early life. Uh, it is going to be uh, interesting. But can you imagine what it must have been like to be the mother of Jesus. So Mary's going to have some significant things. God is doing something very significant. And, and you know, oftentimes God does significant things in ordinary circumstances, doesn't he? Mary was not wealthy. Neither was Joseph. Uh, they were humble people. Uh, he was a carpenter. And, and she uh, actually it is... Uh, is having her baby in a manger because there's no room. I mean, there weren't VIPs. It wasn't like, they, hey, buddy, you're out of here. we got some VIPs here. Uh, no, they said, no, we, sorry, we don't have room for you. You're going to have to be out in the manger. And this ordinary family and ordinary circumstances and every day, 
Yes, today is just like it was yesterday. You know, there's regular cycles of life that we all experience. God was doing an amazing work. You know, God does more while we're not looking than we can imagine. God had a plan. You know, we need to remember that when we're afraid, God has a plan for us. And can I tell you something? Satan himself cannot stop God's plan for you as you follow him in faith. God's plan will be accomplished. Listen, there, there's, you are indestructible until God's finished with you. I believe that with all my heart. There may come time, a time where it is dangerous to preach the gospel. Where I'm thrown in prison or my life is at risk because I preach the gospel. If that day comes, I want to tell you something. I'm in the hands of God. Nothing can stop his work and his plan in me. Isn't that great? And one day, and if they do persecute me, guess what? I get treasure in heaven. If they do kill me, I get promoted to glory. <laughs> and you can't beat that. Listen, you ought to rejoice. In the midst of your circumstances, God is at work. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But he is at work. Jesus in one place said, uh, my father is working. And I too am working. Did you know God's always working? And he created you with a purpose. He fashioned you in your mother's womb with his purpose in mind. He gave you specific gifts. He gave you specific talents. He gave you specific ways and inclinations of heart so that you would be able to fulfill the purpose for which he created you. So things of eternity have happened. Listen, I don't care what happens in Washington. God still has a plan for your life. I don't care what the value of the dollar is. God still has a plan. And the Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Rejoice! You're a child of the king. God's got a plan for you. You know, it's amazing. Uh, when you go through difficulty and when you go through things that cause you to be afraid, as you lift your eyes to the Lord, how your perspective changes. Where there is worry and where there is fear, as you focus on Him. That's why praise is so important. Because we take our eyes off ourselves and we put our eyes on the Lord and we exalt Him for His name. And He comes and He inhabits the praises of His people and He changes our perspective. He changes our outlook so that we can have joy Right in the middle of the trouble. The angel starts off. He said, rejoice, Mary. You don't have any idea what God's going to do through your life. So our first response to fear in our lives is to rejoice. Secondly, when we're afraid, we need to remember. Not just rejoice, but remember. Remember. Verse 28 says, the angel came to her and said, greetings, favored woman. This word in, in the original Greek is in the perfect tense. And it has the idea of God began to favor her with the re result of that being that his favor rests upon her. Now, that's a, that's a pretty great thing, isn't it? Uh, and she was favored. Of all the women in the world, God chose Mary to raise his son. Talk about a vote of confidence. <laughs> Man, how, how that must have made her feel. But I want to tell you, she also was favored because she was God's child. And listen, I want to tell you, you're favored. If you've repented and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're his child. And you are favored. The favor of God rests upon you. I, Romans 5 says we stand in his grace, in his favor, because of the work of Jesus Christ for us. His righteousness is credited to me. Hallelujah. Uh, so we're, we're favored. Now, why should that help you in times of fear? Because you're God's special child. I want to tell you something. I have, there have been people who've done things to me in my life 
uh, that I put up with, okay? <laughs> and there's been quite a bit I've, I've, I've uh, experienced in my life. But if somebody comes to hurt my family, you better have your life insurance ready. That's all I've got to say. Those are my babies. Because they're not babies anymore, but I've got a new set of babies now. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, that's my family. They're special to me. If you're going to come to them to try to do them harm, you're going to have to go through me. You are the favorite child of God. <laughs> if they want to do something to you, they've got to go through Jesus. Remember what Satan had to do in Job's life? He came to God and said, Lord, I can't do anything to him. You put a hedge of protection around everything he has and everything he does. I can't touch him. And, and he's trying to get God to do Of course, God always uses the devil for his own purposes anyway. And he uses the devil's request to accomplish what he had intended for Job's life, which is another story. But God had to give the devil permission to do anything to Job. Did you know you're bought with a price? You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved son. You belong to Jesus Christ. You're purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, Satan and the demons of hell can't come against you. They have to go through Jesus first. You are his favorite possession. And what, an, what a, a comforting thing to know in the midst of everything that happens. You know, in the book of Judges, Judges is a very dark season in the history of Israel and the people of God had gotten farther and farther away and uh, if you don't know about Jesus I would say the book of Judges would be the most depressing book you could read in the Bible because things just keep getting worse and keep getting worse and keep getting worse but in the middle of that season of time the book of Judges there's a man named Boaz who fears God and honors God with his life. And God is blessing him. In the midst of all that's happening, in the midst of all the chaos, God is blessing this man. And of course, we know the story about Ruth, and she comes and she marries Boaz. And guess what? God still had a plan. He protected Boaz in the midst of all the wickedness and of all the turmoil that was going on. And of course, we know that through Boaz, Ultimately came Jesus Christ. You see, you're the favored possession of God. He's able to hold you in his hand. I, I remember the story of Elijah. I love this story. Uh, even as a kid, I, I read it in the Bible. I thought, man, that is cool. Uh, but Elijah has made a prophecy about the king. And he said, you know, the king is sick, and, and he, he sends a messenger. The king was going to consult a false god to ask him about his health. He says, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to this false god? This is what the Lord says. You're going to die. This sickness will end in death. Well, King Amaziah didn't like that too much. And so he decides he's going to send 50 men to call Elijah on the carpet and bring him before him. So he sends that first 50 men, and the captain of the 50 men says, come down, the king uh, has, has commanded us to come get you to see him. And Elijah said, if I am a man of God, may fire come from heaven and consume you. Whoosh! Fire came from heaven, and all 50 men were crispy critters. <laughs> and they were done. So the king sends another 50. He said, well, I'm going to send another 50. And the like same thing happened. The captain said, come down with us. Uh, the king has, has requires, required you to come uh, to his presence. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, may fire come from heaven and destroy you. Whoosh! Another 50. Hellish. Finally, by the time he sends the third 50, the captain is scared to death. He gets on his knees and he says, Elijah, please spare your servant's life. You know, he said... The king has sent me, but, you know, I, I don't want to be here. And, uh, and of course, Elijah is told by the Lord to go down with him and that it, things will be okay. But God was able to protect his servant. Listen, you are God's favored possession. 
trust him to keep you in the problem of this hand. That doesn't mean that God doesn't allow trouble in our lives. We know the story of Stephen, who was he preached. Uh, ultimately, he was martyred, and they stoned him to death. But I'll tell you what, was Jesus concerned about it? Sure he was. He was standing at the right hand of the Father, watching what was happening to Stephen. And he would, his reward in heaven would be great. Um, but even that could not happen aside from the permission of the Father. So, when you're afraid, prescription for fear, first of all, rejoice. Secondly, remember. Thirdly, rely. Rely. Look at verse 28. The angel says, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Sounds a lot like what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples and lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. God would be with Mary as she raised Jesus. God would be with Mary as people questioned how she became pregnant. God would be with Mary and Joseph as they fled to Egypt from Herod's oppression. God would be with Mary, yes, even as she watched her son die. And he would be with Mary beyond the resurrection as well. You see, every season of her life, God was with her. And God with you and with me in every season of life. Sometimes we may not feel like God's with us. I remember uh, years ago uh, having a kind of a desert experience in my life and being upset with God. I had, uh, I was still going to church. I was still going through all those things, but my heart just wasn't where it needed to be with the Lord. And, and I felt like uh, that God was far away, but he wasn't. He was with me right there, even in my time of rebellion. It was a mild rebellion, but it was rebellion nonetheless. And through a series of circumstances, you know, he just showed me how much he loved me. And I, you know, the, I remember, I'll, I'll never forget uh, the day that God used me in spite of myself. I had repented by that time. But, uh, God blessed me and used me in the first church. I served on staff and uh, I remember come, driving home and the tears were rolling down my cheeks and I said, Lord, I have so, so uh, unjustly accused you and uh, you're so good to me and I don't deserve this and here you are blessing me anyway. See, he never left me. Never left me. Uh, even in the times of Mary's failure. Yeah, they did have some failure, didn't they? Uh, when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry, they thought he lost his marbles. He was skipping meals to minister to people. They thought, he's losing his mind. And they, they came to get him. You remember that time? They said, well, your, your brothers and your, your, your family's out there uh, asking for you. They want to see you. And Jesus said, these are my family members, those who love and do the will of God. And he wasn't denying his earthly family, but he, they thought it was nuts until the resurrection. <laughs> uh, that, that changed their minds about everything, you know. And so uh, John, his cousin, he, he wavered in his faith. Are, are you really the, the one who was to come? And so I praise God for these stories of people's uh, feet of clay because you and I have feet of clay too and it encourages us. God never leaves us in these times. He's, Jesus says, I'm with you always. And so before telling her what her purpose was, he assured her, the Lord is with you. You see, your purpose doesn't rest on your shoulders, ultimately. I mean, we're to be obedient. But the accomplishment of the purposes of God for your life are ultimately on his shoulders. He is the one who does the heavy lifting. You and I are just the, the servants, right? 
You know, it's like that song you, you heard the, about the old violin, you know, and they, they're trying to get a hundred bucks for it or something, and then finally the master comes and he tunes it up and he's playing on this violin. It's just beautiful sound, and now they're, they're giving these exorbitant prices for this violin because of the touch of the master's hand. Listen, that's you and me. We're just the instrument. He's the master. He is the one who accomplishes these things for us. Our job is just to rely on him, to trust him, and to take the next step of obedience in faith and to see what he will do. And Mary would be used greatly because of relying upon the Lord. So when we're afraid, we need to trust the Lord. I, I like what the scripture says elsewhere. What time I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Again, lifting our eyes to him. To trust him. And you know, Jesus said sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Well, you and I, we tend to, and there's nothing wrong with good planning or, or storing up uh, for, for bad days ahead and those kinds of things. Uh, the Bible talks about those things in different places. But Jesus summed it up. He said, he said don't, don't spend all your time worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Look at the lilies of the field. Does not your father clothe them? Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And he speaks in that context. He says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Just trust God with this day. You got enough trouble to deal with today without borrowing trouble from tomorrow, right? Trust Him today. Rely on Him today. And uh, that is a, is a great secret of walking in His joy. So rejoice. The prescription for fear rejoice, remember, rely, finally, rest. Rest. Uh, verse 30, the angel told, tells her, do not be afraid, Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary. Put your own name in there. Do not be afraid, Roger. Right? Rest. Can I tell you something? We have a good shepherd. We've been talking about that in John, haven't we? We have a good shepherd who cares for us. I read Psalm 23 this, this morning. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus has a, a, a staff to get us back on the path when we stray? Yes. He has a rod to protect us when predators come. He's our good shepherd. Amen. You and I can rest in him. He leads us beside still waters. He causes us to lie down in green pastures. So that we can rest. And that's not just true with physical rest. Physical rest is a blessing from God. But spiritual rest. The rest. The peace that passes understanding. It comes from him. Do not be afraid. If you look. Uh, he's telling her what uh, the significance of Jesus will be. Verse 33 says. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no in. Can I tell you, Jesus is ruling and reigning right now. And it's not going to stop. It's going to continue on. Till one day I die and go to be with Jesus if he tarries. His kingdom will not end. And it will go on beyond. Forevermore. His kingdom will have no end. You see, you can rest in Jesus because he's in charge. Jesus, of course, spoke to the winds and the waves. Peace be still. He created the universe. Colossians tells us by his power, all things hold together. Jesus is sovereign over the universe. We were talking about a man in our church uh, that uh, was, was studying the, the fusion, how the sun reacts and all that, and um, he had retired, others was, and they still hadn't figured it out. Uh, it, for decades, they've been studying that. And uh, did you know Jesus knows exactly how that works? <laughs> He's not perplexed about a thing. 
He's sovereign. He's in control. He knows exactly what's going to happen in the universe. He knows exactly what's going to happen on the ocean, what's going to happen in your life, what's going to happen in my life, and he is in utter control. He is the one who speaks to the demoniac and says, go into the herd of pigs, demons, and they have to obey. He is the one who says to Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus gets up. Loose him and let it go. He's walking around with his grave clothes. Uh, he is the one who speaks, uh, and the man born blind is he. Listen, there's nothing too hard for him. That's what he actually goes on to say. Mary says, you know, that's a natural question. She says, well, how's this going to be? How am I going to have a baby? I don't, I've never had a sexual relationship with a man. I don't know a man. And she was betrothed to Joseph, but... But that sexual relationship wasn't consummated until the end of that betrothal. And he says, well, the, the Holy Spirit is going to work a miracle in you so that you become pregnant without a man. And the child who is born to you will be called the Son of God. And then look what he says. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. <laughs> Listen, you can rest. The one who's got your back, he can handle it. Doesn't matter what it is. Rest in him. Cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. Bring your burdens to him. Bring your confusion to him. Bring your frustration to him and even your anger to him. And lay it at his feet. And let him know what's going on with your life. Because he's able. And you can have rest for your souls. I love what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me, and you'll find rest. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. You see, in taking his yoke upon us, and, and coming to him, you see, he says, take my yoke. He's, he's saying, listen, you, you choose to follow me. You choose to repent. You, you choose to, to obey me, and you... Come to me with your brokenness, and I am the one who can give you rest. Isn't that a beautiful truth? And it's never failed. There have been people trying it for centuries, and his promise is always faithful. Um, there's much to be afraid about in this world, but praise God, we have a God who loves us. And who cares for us. What's his prescription for fear? Rejoice. Lift up your eyes. Worship the Lord. And recognize his plan for your life. Remember the good things he's done. The prayers he's answered. The, the faithful things he, he has done in the past. Rely upon him in your situation. And rest upon him. Because he is able. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to put your trust in him. He is able to forgive your sin. He's paid the price. He's able to deliver you from it. He asks for your surrender and asks for your trust. And if you'll, if you'll choose to do that this morning, he can change your heart and change your life and give you hope in the future. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the amazing promises that you've given us and for the assurance that you give us in the midst of our fears, God, that uh, you are with us and that you are able. Uh, help us trust you, Lord. Give us the grace to trust you. Uh, help us rely upon you in, in life and rest in your promises and rest in your, your assurance that... that uh, you are able to handle what we face. And Lord, for those who are here today that don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day 
they would repent of their sin and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And that you'd change them, Lord, give them the joy of your presence and the, the wonderful knowledge that their guilt is no more, that their sin has been buried in the sea of forgetfulness. May it be so today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation, and I want to just invite you. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single one of us present who hasn't filled God in some way. And uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has paid the price at the cross so that we could have eternal life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But if we'll confess our sins, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God has raised you from the dead, we'll be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the message of God's word. If you'd like to make that decision this morning, I want you just to step out from where you're sitting and come here to the front and uh, make that decision public this morning. I'd be happy to help you with a prayer or with any questions you may have. Um, if you're here today as a, as a child of God, maybe you've not been trusted the Lord. You just need to come to this altar and cast your cares upon the Lord this morning. Maybe you're here and you'd like some prayer. I'd be happy to pray with you. Just come forward for, for prayer. Perhaps God has laid upon your heart something you're to do, that you're to surrender to do uh, in your life. Maybe the ministry or something like that. Or perhaps God is calling you today to join with the membership of this church. And you know this is where you're supposed to be and you just need to make it official and get uh, busy uh, serving the Lord with us here in this place. Whatever God's leading you to do, you do it right now. So let's, let's stand. Number four, six, two.